Today on The Hookup, we're gonna talk about why the color of your LED strips sometimes looks different at the end of the strip than it does at the beginning. I'm gonna explain why it happens, give you a couple ways to fix it, and hopefully dispel some myths about burning your house down. If you've ever seen an LED strip that changes to a reddish tone as it gets further away from the power source, you've witnessed a phenomenon that's called voltage drop. If you've taken a high school physics class, you might find voltage drop a little bit confusing. Because in high school, you do physics in a perfect world where friction doesn't exist, strings are inextensible, and most importantly for today, wires have no resistance. When looking at a wiring schematic, you'll see components like resistors, transistors, capacitors, and diodes, but in real life, the lines that connect them can be just as important to the overall system. This video is sponsored by PCBWay. PCBWay is a full-featured PCB manufacturer. PCBWay can of course make your printed circuit boards that you've designed, but they also have a huge library of shared projects from different creators to browse through. So whether you're a professional electrical engineer or a tinkerer, PCBWay can help you make your projects a reality. Check out the link down in the description to help support my channel. In the case of an LED strip, the wires are actually thin copper ribbons that run the entire length of the strip. When most people think of an electrical circuit, there's a positive wire and a negative wire, and the current runs from the positive wire through each component until it gets to the negative wire. This is called a series circuit. But most LED strips don't work like that, and they're instead wired in parallel, meaning there's a continuous copper trace carrying a positive voltage running down the entire strip and it independently feeds each LED or a small group of LEDs, and then a continuous negative voltage runs on the opposite side. To understand why the color of your LED strip changes as the strip gets longer, think of the positive wire like a feeding trough for cattle that are all lined up in a straight line, and the negative wire is a uh, waste trough. If the cows aren't very hungry and each one just takes a little bit of food, then the cows at the end will get the same amount of food as the ones at the beginning. But as the trough gets longer or the cows become hungrier, the cows at the end will be left with less food. There are generally three solutions to this problem. The first thing we can do is make sure that our cows aren't very hungry. On your LED strip, this is equivalent to running your LEDs at a lower brightness, meaning each LED will consume less current, leaving plenty in the trough. This is the easiest fix, and by gradually reducing the brightness until the color change is indistinguishable, you can decide if you want to take additional steps to allow for higher brightness without any color inaccuracies. If you buy a pre-built solution from companies like Philips Hue, LifeX, or even Govee, they usually make this calculation for you and automatically limit the brightness of the strip to make sure it looks good at the beginning and the end. But you won't necessarily be able to daisy chain the strips together to create longer LED runs, and you're going to end up paying more per strip. If you roll your own solution using individually addressable LEDs, I'm going to suggest WLED for your controller, which has a powerful current limiting function that works amazingly well. So well, in fact, that I'm able to run 1,050 LEDs in seven 5 volt strips without any extra wiring and no color inaccuracy. For reference, here's what the strip looks like at full brightness white with no current limiting. This is a mess. And then here's the same strip with a 2000 milliamp current limiter. Again, no extra wiring, just WLED's amazing current limiting calculation. The best part is that it isn't just limiting the overall brightness. Based on the effect that you're using, it's calculating the estimated current draw of each LED and then putting it at its maximum relative brightness without going over your current limitation. If you're new to LED strips, this might not seem amazing to you, but take my word for it, it is incredible. But if you want more brightness out of your LEDs, you're gonna to need to move on to the next fix. Back to the farm. The second option is to push the food down the trough faster and with more pressure. The problem with this solution is that if each cow isn't ready to accept this amount of food, they're gonna choke on it and die. In terms of electricity, how hard the electrons are being pushed down the wire is measured in voltage. And just like the cows, if you power a 5 volt strip with 12 volts, you're going to force feed each LED more than it can handle and it too will die. A 12 volt strip generally groups LEDs together so they can split the voltage evenly, which is why your LED strip may have cut lines that are after every three LEDs instead of after each one. And it's why popular strips like the WS2811 that are used by Govi are not quite individually addressable but are instead controlled in groups of three that split up their supply voltage. Another issue with higher voltage is that if your trough is too small, the food may start to overflow down the line. In LED terms, this is the equivalent to your wires heating up. 
In my permanent exterior LED setup, I use thin 22 gauge wire running inside the channels with the LED strips. And I've had dozens of comments telling me I'm gonna burn down my house by pulling 30 amps through 22 gauge wire. And they're not wrong. 30 amps through 22 gauge wire would very likely start a fire. However, using five volts, it's basically impossible to push 30 amps through a wire that small. Here's a little experiment that I did by creating a short at the end of a five volt run. You can see that thermally, there's not much going on. And even in a dead short, I'm pulling less than four amps through this wire. It's still a waste of energy, but it's not a fire hazard. Compare that to a 12 volt strip, and you can see that the wires do heat up over time, and they may get hot enough to cause a fire. And with 120 volts, the insulation on the wire basically melts away instantly. And in this case, you can see that the circuit breaker blew before any further damage could be done, but you can see how a greater push could definitely lead to some issues with smaller wire sizes. There's a reason why becoming a licensed electrician certified to work on mains voltage is much more difficult than getting your low voltage license. That's because in general, low voltage is much safer. If you want the safest LEDs out there, you're gonna want five volt LEDs. And unfortunately, if you want the highest brightness possible with those five volt LEDs, you're gonna need to do a little bit of additional wiring. Which leads me to my last fix, power injection. Power injection is a non-scientific term that refers to adding additional wires to your circuit in parallel. And it's the most common way to get the highest possible brightness and color accuracy out of your LED installs. At the farm, you're gonna add additional points where the food enters the trough. The source of the food is still the same, but by adding additional entry points, it allows for the food to be evenly distributed. In your LED install, power injection can be accomplished in three different ways. Number one, a long wire can run alongside your LED strip inside the channel, and then you can periodically tap into that long wire to connect it to your LED strips. Number two, you can make what are called home runs, which are wires that connect all the way back to the power supply and then to a specific position on the LED strip. And then last, multiple power supplies can be used throughout a single run. Though if you're gonna use this method, your wiring will become a little bit more complicated since the positive wires of two supplies should never be connected together, either directly or indirectly. The best way to inject power for maximum performance would be to run a pair of huge cables directly from the power supply to each LED on the strip, but that's clearly not feasible. So instead, the best way to inject power is to balance your performance expectations with your effort. As I've already mentioned, my preferred method that balances cost, ease of installation, and performance is to run 22 gauge wire inside the aluminum channels alongside the LED strips, essentially increasing the size of the positive and negative traces on those LED strips. And then I run 16 gauge home runs directly from the power supply to specific easily accessible locations throughout the run. These home runs are kind of a pain, but the more home runs you make, the greater brightness you'll be able to achieve. Here's what that strip looks like with no power injection. You can see that I'm able to get full color accuracy using a 2000 milliamp current limiter in the WLED program. With only my 22 gauge wiring and no home runs, I'm able to increase that current limit up to 4000 milliamps. Without the 22 gauge wires, but adding two home runs, I'm able to push it all the way up to 9000 milliamps on the current limiter before I get any noticeable color inaccuracies. And by combining the two methods, I can get all the way up to 20,000 milliamps or 20 amps at full brightness white. If you've got a really long run and you wanna use two different power supplies, you need to be careful not to connect the positive lines of your power supplies together. Your grounds can and should always be connected together and the data line should run all the way throughout the strip, but the positive wires need to be separate to avoid issues that can be caused by switch mode power supplies being out of phase with each other. Honestly, for most installs, the multiple power supply option should be used as a last resort, and it's probably best to leave this to the LED experts. So why do your LED strips turn red at the end anyways? We tend to associate the color red with heat, so lots of people think that the strip is overheating. But the real reason is because the red LED in the chip requires less voltage to light up than the blue and the green ones do. So as voltage drop becomes more and more of an issue, the blue and green channels will experience a greater decrease in brightness than the red channel does, which then shifts all your colors into the red spectrum. You might ask, why not just increase the width of the trough so you can fit more food through it? Well, this would be equivalent to increasing the overall size of the copper traces on the strip, which not only cost more money to produce, but also would require the strip to be wider and thicker and therefore less flexible. In the case of traditional single color LED strips, each trace on the strip can occupy half of the strip's width. But if you have an RGBW strip, you're gonna need a separate trace for the negative of each color and then a bigger trace to send the positive voltage. 
This means that you'll need to divide the strip width into six different sections, which means less food per trough, or less electrons per LED. In other words, the more different colors you want on a traditional LED strip, the thinner the traces will be and the more voltage drop becomes an issue. For individually addressable LEDs, the different colors are controlled in a circuit within the LED strip, so you only need to send your positive, negative, and then data. The other nice thing is that due to the nature of data, its trace doesn't need to be very thick, so the majority of the strip can be occupied by the positive and negative traces. Some different types of individually addressable strips have additional lines for things like backup data or clock, and as expected, those strips suffer more from voltage drop than their three-wire counterparts. So a quick recap. If your LED strip looks like this, you've probably got voltage drop issues. The easiest fix is to turn down the brightness, which causes each LED to require less current, leaving plenty for the rest of the strip. If lowering the brightness is not an acceptable solution to you, you can inject power at different points by running additional wires back to the power supply and connecting positive to positive and negative to negative. To avoid the impacts of voltage drop in the first place, you can use higher voltage LEDs. But you should be aware that as the voltage gets higher, the potential for a fire caused by faulty wiring goes up. 5 volt strips will definitely be the safest, and for runs under 3 meters and less than 100 LEDs total, you can safely use 5 volt strips at full brightness without any power injection. And 12 volt strips can be used up to about 8 meters or 240 LEDs. In all cases, adding a fuse to your power wire is good practice, and using a power supply that has short circuit protection is always a good idea. I want to make it clear that I am not an electrician, an electrical engineer, an insurance adjuster, or a lawyer. I am a certified high school physics teacher with plenty of knowledge and coursework in electricity. Please, if you are unsure about how to wire these things, do a little more research or get a qualified professional to help you. There is no need to put yourself or your family in danger for some pretty lights. Thank you so much to my awesome patrons over at Patreon for your continued support of my channel. If you're interested in supporting my channel, please check out the links down in the description. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that thumbs up button and consider subscribing. And as always, thanks for watching The Hookup.